how can we make math more human? Because this is a major theme that I really try to bring. So one of the ways, and someone spoke of this, is to weave in history and philosophy and, and to, make it, to make it seem like these were things that real human beings struggled with. This was a part of our, the development of our civilization, and it very much was. So when we do the quadratic formula, anyone remember the quadratic formula? X equals the opposite of B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. I don't know why you'd remember that honestly, but. Uh. <laughs> and it's a very useful and powerful tool when you're doing Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and all of that. You know, and I remember actually, I had a good, I, I actually had a really good algebra teacher when I was in school, and I remember proving that. That was cool. I always feel it's very unfortunate when students, again, just like I did with the area of the circle, it's unfortunate when it's just written on the board, okay, now use it. To actually prove it, that's significant, that's depth. And what we do here, which I think is fantastic, and this was introduced to me by my mentor when I started my Waldorf teacher training, is we go back and look at the first person who ever did it. We read the work of Al Khwarizmi, who's known in seventh grade and introduced in seventh grade as the father of algebra. In the year 825, he comes out with the first book ever written on algebra. The Greeks had kind of, they, it was so geometry based for the ancient Greeks, and they had kind of done algebra, but it was so enmeshed in geometry. And here it was, the first book of just pure algebra. And you know what's really fascinating? Nowhere in it do you see anything written that resembles what you would consider an equation. So nowhere are you going to see something like 3x plus 5 equals 7. Why? And we talk about this. This is how it evolved. And for the students to understand this, I think it's quite important. That symbol right there never came about and was agreed upon until the, the late 1500s. When Descartes writes his book, and we study that, we study how, how did Rene Descartes in 1637 come about for the first time with coordinate geometry. Coordinate geometry. You remember this, don't you? Maybe some of you have had nightmares about this sort of thing, right? The y-axis, the x-axis. We go back and look at how Descartes did that. And in the process of doing that, we see that his equal sign looks like this. Because they hadn't agreed upon what an equal sign was. He was actually the first person, Descartes, again in 1637, was the first person to actually use an exponent. The first person to use an exponent. So when we go back, now I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going back and forth here. That was 11th grade Descartes, and it ties in. Because when we're reading Al Khwarizmi in 9th grade, he's written this in 825, we actually read his book, and guess what? There's nothing resembling an equation. It's all written in words. It's all written in words. So he'll talk about something like four squares and five roots are equal to seven. And he writes it out, four. He even writes out, well, it was written in Arabic, but the English translation, and it's neat because we, we have the work in front of us and it's one side is the English translation, the other side's Arabic. That's kind of neat. What did I say? Four squares and how many roots did I say? Five roots is seven. It's interesting. That I just translated his very awkward way of wording it because there wasn't the language of algebra. This is a very powerful language. It's, and the kids appreciate that after reading his work. It's like, whoa, it's so hard to understand this because it's written like it in, I mean, you'd literally glance at it, and for all you'd know, just glancing at it, it was a letter to someone's friend. Right? But no, it's actually algebra, and it makes them appreciate how far we've come, and indeed that's true. Al Khwarizmi comes out with his book in 825, but it wasn't until 1600 that it took off because now there was a language to express it. There was terminology, there were symbols that made it much more sensible. So other examples of what we do here, um, permutations, combinations, and probability. Ever heard of permutations and combinations? It's like, how many possible ways, and I do this in ninth grade, how many possible seating charts are there for everyone here? I do this in the ninth grade. Okay, here's one. 
All right now, you two people get up and switch seats. Oh, there's a second one. And how many different possible ones are there? These big questions. Normally in mainstream education today, we introduce, they, they'll introduce probability, permutations, combinations, these sort of things, and as early as first grade. And you can do very simple problems, but my point is we wait, and this is a good example of, I think, the power of Waldorf education again, we wait until they can do problems that are really deeply significant. For instance, and maybe I don't know if we should do this, but we could. How many people do we have in the room? I think 30? I think I counted 30 at one point. What is the probability that two people in the room have the same birthday? You ever heard that? It's a wonderful question, isn't it? So we build up, and again, I'll pose that on the first day, and it will take us three weeks to get to the point of answering it. Right? And in the end, isn't that cool? In the end, it's really easy. Right? In the end, it's actually really easy. How many people do you need in the room to have a 50% probability of two people having a common birthday, do you think? Wouldn't you think like 150 or something? It's 22. It's 22. It's a really neat thing. And I went at about the time, um, I actually went and, and surveyed all of our classes. And this was a couple years ago. Enrollment was down a little bit, which mathematically made things very neat. Uh, because it was, the average was about 22. Right? And so we went, and guess what? 14 classes, including the two kindergartens we had at that time. I went and asked, simple question, with the exception of twins, with the exception of twins, do you have two people in your class with the same birthday? And guess what the number was? Seven. Seven classes had common birthdays, and the average number of kids was about 22. It was really interesting. And in the class that I was teaching that in, there were three common birthdays. Really, that was unusual. Yeah? But that's the kind of deep problem that you can do with ninth graders, and they can feel when they get to the end of that, it's like, wow, look what I'm able to do. Yeah? It really empowers their thinking, and it really belongs in ninth grade. That doesn't mean you couldn't do simple problems like, have you ever heard of this kind of problem? There are five marbles and five blue marbles and three green marbles in a bag. Pick out one marble. What's the probability it's blue? I mean, honestly, I look at that and I think, well, who cares? It's not that, Im it's not that interesting, is it really? Yeah. Right? Now, yes, to understand probability, you need to be able to do that little problem, but that should be a, a stepping stone to do something more interesting. Right? And that's what we're really trying to build up to. Um, another example, 10th grade, Euclid. You know, everybody studied geometry at some point, I'm assuming, and you were studying proofs. Do you remember doing proofs? Okay, what we do is we go back and we look at the guy who did it first, Euclid. We go back more than 2,000 years and look at his work. It's really amazing to do that. Geometry textbooks today, I would call a dumbed-down version of Euclid. Other people would say it's more modern, okay. But to go back and look at the original source, I think, really brings home this idea of making math more human. Uh, in 10th grade mechanics, now I'm in the realm of science, but I know uh, Miss Sai here, in 10th grade mechanics, they go back and redo Galileo's experiment of trying to determine what's called the law of falling bodies. You ever heard this rumor that he took two, he took, um, two large balls, I think he had one uh, steel ball and another one made of something else, and he dropped them from the top of the, the leaning tower of Pisa and they you know, fell at the same rate or something. Well, that's a lie, he never did that, but anyway. It's a nice story, though, isn't it? But what he actually did is he rolled balls down inclined planes and did all these experiments with it and actually proved that Aristotle was wrong. Yeah? So in 10th grade here, we reenact that. It's a wonderful thing to do. It makes it, again, more human. You're struggling with the same thing. Very interesting question that came out of that discussion I saw with Ms. Sai is, how did they time it? They had no stopwatch. No timing mechanism that would be accurate. How'd they do it? What do you think? It's a very interesting question. You know how they did it? They figure now. They fig I think they have some evidence to show. Music. They'd play the same musical tune again and again. And you feel inside you if it's the same cadence. We all have that music inside us that tells us that. And so they just count beats. And that was accurate enough. Interesting, eh? In seventh grade, I'm jumping around a little bit, to do pi. What does do pi mean? Yeah. 
to actually calculate pi for yourself. It's a wonderful thing to do. Everyone should have that experience. You go home and you measure the circumference of a bike wheel, you measure the diameter, and you divide it out. But there's a lot of buildup before you get there. You really have to understand ratios very well. And then in 10th grade, which I'm about to do with my class now, and this is a wonderful thing for sure, and I'm thinking it's, is it Bianca's that's doing this? Actually seeing how Archimedes did it. How did Archimedes calculate pi to as much accuracy, accuracy as you could possibly want? And he concluded this. He said, I know, pi is a little bit less than 3 and a 7th, and it's a little bit greater than, that would be the same thing. It wouldn't work, would it? 10 71st. 3 and 10 71st. Pi is in between these two values. How did he do that? Not through measurement, through thinking. Very ingenious. And so my Archimedes did this. And so I have a couple of 10th graders right now that are preparing to show the whole class. They will be teaching. This is a wonderful thing to do to 10th graders. Sometimes 10th graders get rather full of themselves. Well, yeah, I could do better than that. Right? So you go, okay, you teach the class now. <laughs> So I'm having 10, it's a wonderful thing actually. They go up and they teach the class for two days. It's a fantastic thing to do. And they're showing how Archimedes did this. And I think, actually I'd like to end with a story and then I'll take questions. And my story is this. Uh, some of you have heard me say that it's a favorite story of mine, so I'll say it again perhaps for some of you. Um, when I first came to Boulder, before I actually came to the school and discovered Waldorf education, I was tutoring math. And I was tutoring one um, girl, I think she may have been in middle school at that point, and I, I can't even remember her name, but I remember her father's name because I used to have many interesting conversations with him after I was done with my tutoring sessions. And his name was Roger, and he was the, um, he was the founder of some high-tech corporate corporation in town, and he was doing very well. And he had quite a few employees working for him. And one point, and here I was, more or less fresh out of graduate school, um, and, and I asked him, I said, Roger, what do you look for when you're hiring somebody new for your company? I mean, I was just genuinely interested to see what he would say. And he said, well, because it's a computer company, he says, I need somebody who knows something about computers. If it's computer programming, well, I can find lots of computer programmers pretty easily. You know, that's not really a challenge. But if I want to find somebody who really is going to make a difference for my corporation, he says, I want to see somewhere on their resume that they're an artist. And he meant it quite literally. He meant he wanted to see that they had some sort of musical background or fine arts background or something where he could see that they were creative in their very core. And I found that was really interesting. And now that I look back at it, I think that to me is an essential part of Waldorf education. Because we want people that can graduate our 12th grade not only being artists and musicians and mathematicians, they are well-rounded completely. And I think that's what we really need in terms of scientists and mathematicians and engineers people who really have that artistic component because I think that really goes a long way in terms of creative thinking and that's what we really need in the world today.